This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hey everybody, and welcome back to a new video. A few weeks ago, I posted a video on ISO, which got lots of attention, about half a million views in the first month. In it, I suggested that the advice that people are usually given to shoot at the lowest possible ISO was often misused and misunderstood, and often led to poor results by people who would have been better off shooting at a higher ISO. Well, the video received 30,000 likes and 2,000 comments, tons of engagement, but some people disagreed with my assertions and told me I didn't know what I was talking about, which I'm sure is sometimes true. In this case, some of the comments had merit, even though I may have disagreed with their conclusions. Others were unfortunately misinformed. So in this video, I'll address the comments in a true or false format and dive deeper into noise, what it is, where it comes from, and how you can use this knowledge to get better results. Don't forget to stay for my bonus tip, where I show you how to take high noise and low dynamic range images and still get results like this. My name is Simon Dantremont, and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. Now, if you want the full story, you can always check out my first video on ISO, which you can see here and come back afterwards. In short, I explain that while shutter speed and aperture actually affect how much light goes into your sensor, ISO is only a gain or volume knob in your camera to brighten exposures that are too dark. ISO isn't increasing the camera's sensitivity to light. That's a hangover description from the film days. I also explained that noisy images are noisy because there's not enough light in them, leading to what is called a poor signal to noise ratio. Images that need really high ISOs to be appropriately bright are noisy because they had a very low amount of light on the sensor. And I explained that the image was noisy before the ISO was raised, such that the high ISO is revealing that it was noisy, not creating the noise. So now let's look at some of the comments from my first video and tackle them one at a time. One was the noise isn't created by a poor signal to noise ratio, but by heat. Or high ISO is making the noise worse by amplifying it. These have some truth in them, but neither of these are actually the main cause of noise. The way sensors work is they contain millions of photocytes which capture photons that are measured as an electrical charge. We call these pixels after they're converted to a digital signal. This charge is then amplified by the ISO amplifier, which applies a magnification factor to the signal to brighten it, depending on the setting of your ISO. The signal is then converted from an analog charge to a digital value in an analog to digital converter. Now it's true that as the ISO is raised in the same situation, the image gets more noise as the ISO goes up. But this largely is because as the ISO goes up, the image captured before the gain was raised has less and less light as the ISO needs to go up higher and higher. In these examples, the noisiest image at ISO 24,800 also had the least amount of light on the sensor due to the shutter speeds and apertures used, which didn't allow for much exposure on the sensor. So what is noise anyway? Noise is any random variation in the brightness of color information in photography that's unwanted. I'll explain that this can be during the capture of the information, the conversion to a digital signal, or even processing of this information. Now, there are actually several types of noise in digital cameras. Let's go through them. The most important type of noise in modern digital photography is called shot noise. Shot noise, also called photon noise, is caused by the fact that light in the form of photons isn't a perfectly homogeneous thing. A good analogy is putting out glasses in the rain. Let's pretend glasses are photocytes on your sensor designed to catch photons of light. If you expose these glasses to the rain for one second, the same way that your shutter exposes the sensor in your camera, the number of raindrops in your glasses will vary from glass to glass. One glass might catch nine raindrops, one 11, one seven, and one 13. Photons behave the same way. When they're dark, you can't tell there's a problem. But if I multiply them all by 50, which is the same as raising the ISO a lot to get to medium gray, the resulting image looks like this. As you can tell, there's a lot of variation between the brightness of the photocytes. This is called shot noise. 
I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video who makes this type of content possible, Surfshark. I recently went to Africa and I'm going back a few times next year and I'm worried about my privacy, my data, and my laptop, tablet, and phone security when traveling and using public Wi-Fi sites like in airports. I did some research on how to protect myself before going and a virtual private network or VPN was my solution. A VPN like Surfshark keeps my online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between my devices and the internet. This keeps my personal data protected from cyber criminals or people trying to get access to my private information, especially when I'm using public Wi-Fi, one of the most vulnerable places for your private data and passwords. I'm usually a very trusting person and I'd like to see the best in everyone, but I had a friend get his Instagram account hacked in the last year and it was a nightmare and really damaging for his photography business. There are some really bad actors out there, so don't let this happen to you. I've chosen Surfshark because it allows for any number of devices all in one account. So I can have it on this and on this and even on this. You can even have a 30 day money back guarantee. And on top of that, use promo code Simon Dautremont for an extra three months free. There's a link below. How do you reduce shot noise? You leave the glasses out longer in the rain or expose your sensor to more light with a longer shutter speed or a larger aperture or you add artificial light. Now, why does this work? That's because if you leave glasses out in the rain longer, the variation between them gets less. For example, if you leave the glasses out in the rain for 30 minutes where they're gonna average 500 drops, one glass might have 506 drops, one 487, one 515, and one 493. But the variation will be a lot less than the 30% from the average that we saw earlier. And see what the resulting image looks like? It's more homogeneous, less noisy. So having more light collected meant one, that the variation between the pixels is less, and two, I didn't need to magnify it as much to get it to an appropriate brightness. So what's the lesson here about shot noise? If you want to reduce noise in your images, get more photons on your sensor. You do this by having longer shutter speeds, more open apertures, or putting artificial light on your subject. This of course is a trade-off. If you have too long an exposure and you have fast action, you will get blurry images. The next major types of noise have nothing to do with light. This noise is a combination of read noise and fixed pattern noise. There are a few things at play here. One is that electronics aren't perfect. And even if you send a perfect 500 photons into each photosite on your sensor, one photosite will say it caught 506 and another will say it caught 493. Then the reading of the number of the photons needs to get converted to a digital number. Guess what? When you convert the voltage of 500 photons to a digital signal, sometimes you'll get 498 and sometimes you'll get 513. When we raise the ISO, we reveal these inconsistencies and sometimes magnify them. The good news is that better and better sensors that are coming out all the time are continually improving this type of noise. Whereas shot noise, we can't fix. It turns out that for most cameras, increasing the signal or the gain or the ISO to improve the signal to noise ratio before sending it through the camera electronics is better than doing it in processing and leads to cleaner images. So properly exposing your photo with a higher ISO is better than underexposing with a lower ISO and trying to increase the brightness and processing later. As I discussed in my first video on this topic, some camera sensors can do better at this than others, and the ones that do it the best are called ISO invariant. Now, what about the comment that noise is created by heat? It's true it can, but isn't really an issue in regular photography. Heat buildup on your sensor does indeed cause the ejection of electrons that fool the sensor into thinking this is light, but you need to take really long exposures before this becomes a problem. Now heat is an issue in astrophotography where I often take five minute exposures and many of them in a row for hours at a time. Now that's why astrophotography cameras like this one actually have a fan and a cooling unit built right in it to keep the sensor cool. In regular photography, the only time where I worry about this is in time lapses, where between the hundreds of five second exposures that I use to take a time lapse like this one, I leave one second in between each exposure to give the sensor a chance to stay cool. Otherwise, don't worry about it. 
Another comment on my previous video was, yes, but raising your ISO reduces your dynamic range. This is true. Dynamic range is a measure in stops of light representing how many shades of brightness a camera sensor can capture, with something like 12 or 13 stops being good performance and near the top of the range. As you can see here on this graph from photons to photos.net, as you raise the ISO, the dynamic range is less. Remember the glasses that could hold a thousand drops of water? If you leave them out for too long, or in sensor speak, raise the ISO too high, what happens when you hit 1001 drops of water? The glass can't hold it anymore because it's full. The same thing applies to photosites on your sensor. They have a limit of how many photons they can catch before they get full, called the full well depth. After that, you've overexposed your photo. While the statements are accurate, I guess I still disagree that this is an issue to overly worry about. Here on this chart is a representation of how many stops of dynamic range I have on my Canon R5 sensor. If I shoot it at ISO 3200, I get 7.27 stops of dynamic range. Do I worry about that? Not really. Ansel Adams took some of the best photos ever using a box camera with seven or eight stops of dynamic range. For my part, I don't set my ISO higher than I need to, but if I need high shutter speed and low light to capture some wildlife, I use the ISO needed to get the shutter speed I need, and I live with the reduction in dynamic range. I took this photo at ISO 12,800, so it only had five stops of dynamic range. I'm more worried about the composition than the lack of dynamic range. This owl photo was shot with a crop sensor camera from 2014, the Canon 7D Mark II at ISO 6400, so less than five stops of dynamic range. It was in low light conditions, so to get the shot, I needed to raise my ISO. It was this or no shot at all. Getting the shot was my priority. These shots all have seven or eight stops of dynamic range. When a hurricane blew down this famous tree in Nova Scotia, the word went out that I had a nice photo of it that people wanted to remember the tree by. I sold 60 prints of it in a week. Did anyone care that it had seven or eight stops of dynamic range? Nope. Yes, more dynamic range is better. But should you miss great moments and great shots by desperately trying to keep it at a magic number of stops at all cost? I don't think you should. Get the shot. Here's an example. I arrived at a pond early in the morning. It was very dim. I got out of my vehicle and there was a wood duck right in front of me. I got down and fired off a few shots, trying to get cute with it and keep the ISO low. I had one 250th of a second, f5.6 at ISO 1600 but I didn't have enough shutter speed to get a sharp photo. As you can see, the photo is soft, so this is a throwaway shot. A few minutes later, the scop went by and I raised my shutter speed to 1 800th of a second, leaving me with ISO 8000. This allowed me to get the shot. Does it matter that the wood duck was shot at eight stops of dynamic range and the scop at six stops? It doesn't to me. The better image quality shot is going in the trash and the one with the crappy dynamic range is the keeper. A wee bit of noise reduction on it and I'm golden. Another comment was, what's important when it comes to ISO is always shooting at the native ISO of your camera as the noise is less there. It is indeed true that cameras have what's called a native ISO. That is an ISO where the camera neither turns up the gain to amplify signals nor turns them down. Some cameras even have dual native ISOs, meaning there are two ISO settings that get the best results. Now on some cameras, these are two separate electronic systems that can be used independently depending on the ISO setting. On other cameras, this is just probably software making it look this way. So some people will say that it's critical to shoot at their native ISOs. Now if I had a studio shooting portraits or doing product photography where you're controlling the light and using the same settings over and over every day, sure, use the native ISO. But for going out in the real world conditions where your settings are always changing, should you stick to the native ISO settings all the time? I can tell you when I do. I've shot over 1 million photos in the last 10 years and I've never set my camera intentionally to a native ISO setting ever. So someone might say that because of the ISO to noise chart for my Canon R5, I should shoot at ISO 400 and not 320 because it has less noise. Here are photos shot at ISO 100, 200, 320, 400, and 640. There's not enough difference for me to ever worry about which of these I've used. As I mentioned in my first video, I do keep my ISO low in landscape photography when I'm on a tripod. But if I'm shooting a waterfall and I flip the ISO button to lower it and it goes to 400 instead of 100, I don't care and I don't even change it. I like it low-ish when shooting on a tripod, 
but what the exact figure is, I don't care. A few people made the comment that the saying about low ISO shouldn't be shoot at the lowest ISO possible, but should be use the lowest ISO that you can after you've selected the aperture and shutter speed that ensures you get the shot that you wanted. True, 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 million percent true. This in the end is the heart of the matter. People are told some version of always shoot at the lowest ISO. And this invariably gets interpreted that you should shoot at the lowest ISO as the top priority above and beyond getting the shutter speed you need or getting the right exposure. This of course is the problem. It makes obvious sense to an experienced photographer, but for people just starting out, it leads to issues. Let's give people just learning photography a chance to learn with the knowledge that empowers them to control their camera, not their camera control them. And I promised you a bonus tip, and that's to embrace the creative opportunities that higher noise and lower dynamic range can create. Expose for the shadows and let the sky blow out. Don't worry about the color fidelity and go black and white. You don't need to see image quality as the be all and end all of photography. If you shoot in contrasty situations or poor light, use what you have and get creative. Make some moody images. Use the high key approach and let the highlights go. Crush the darks in the background and let them go pure black. If your photos look pale and dull because of lack of dynamic range, lower the exposure and go for a dark contrasty look. If you need to blow out a wee bit of whites in the highlights, is it really the end of the world? 99.9% .9 of photographers aren't planning on placing a fine art print in a museum or gallery. Let the subject and the action tell the story rather than the number of color variations in the photo. It's your art, so don't be afraid to make it what you want. Innovate and don't follow anyone else's rules. Now, in case you didn't see my original video on why shooting at ISO 100 isn't always the right choice, you can check it out right here. If you thought this video was deserving, give it a like and YouTube will share it with even more photographers, helping them along their own photography journey. And if you're looking to get a VPN, don't forget to give Surfshark a look. There's a link below. I hope you can go out there and take your own amazing and creative photos, even if you need to use a higher ISO. I know you can do it.